the amazing Bible prophecy about Tyre and hopefully as we go through our considerations this evening we will find that it is indeed absolutely amazing this prophecy and not just the prophecy but the way that the prophecy has been fulfilled. But before perhaps we go into that I think it's worth us just considering a couple of things about the Bible's claims. You see the Bible's like no other book. We read here in the second of Peter we have also a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you do well that ye take heed, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word there moved, it really means driven. These men were compelled, as it were, to write down the things that we read. It's the same word as that word driven there, it's, or moved. It's the same word used in Acts of a, of a boat driven beyond control towards the shore. And so the claim of the Bible is that it wasn't written by men. It wasn't because Ezekiel sat down one day and thought, well, I'm going to write this prophecy against Tyre. The claim of the Bible is that these are the words of God, which Ezekiel was compelled to write down. And one of the key things about the God of the Bible, one of the key distinguishing features is that he claims to be a God who can see things in the future. That's what prophecy really is, isn't it? So in Isaiah 46, God says, I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things are not, that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And that's why the Bible is really unique. It's even unique amongst religious texts. You know, the Quran does not have prophecy like the Bible. The Buddhist texts do not have prophecy like the Bible. And one of the hallmarks, one of the challenges of the Bible is that it says, I am from a God who can see the future. So this afternoon, God willing, we have an opportunity to consider one of those prophecies around this place called Tyre. So perhaps we should have a bit of context so where's Tyre? Well, it's on the, the far east of the Mediterranean. It was the, the really the, the, the international kind of hub, the centre of trading in the ancient world. We see it was part of the great Phoenician um, civilization that kind of colonised and populated most of the areas around the Mediterranean Sea. And this is well documented in history, um, the, the wonder of the Phoenicians. This is a quote from Herodotus who said uh, in his histories, according to the Persians best informed in history, the Phoenicians who had formed, formerly dwelt on the shores of the Ethrian Sea, having migrated to the Mediterranean and settled in the parts which they now inhabit, begin at once, they say, to adventure on long voyages, freighting their vessels with the wares of Egypt and Assyria. And it's been said um, that they, they circumvented the whole of Africa. And there's even some scholars which suggest they came all the way to our shores here in, in Britain. So the Phoenicians then were very, very well travelled. And at the heart of their civilization, there was this great city of Tyre. And Tyre turns up in the Bible quite a bit, actually, particularly in the reigns of King David of Israel and King Solomon, his son and particularly in connection with one of their kings, King Hiram, who ruled around 900 BC, the city of Tyre. Now Hiram, we're told in scripture, he, he kind of allied himself with David, and then later with Solomon. He helped, for example, build King David a house. He helped Solomon with materials for the building of God's temple in Jerusalem. And we read later in, in Kings that he had a joint overseas trade alliance with Solomon, which made Solomon one of the richest kings of the ancient times. And so he was well ingrained into, um, into, into Israeli um, politics at that time. And we have a number of prophecies, though, later after this time of Tyre's downfall. You see, it seems that although Tyre had this quite close connection with God's people, unfortunately, as time went on, they forgot about the, uh, the things of God. And so we find many of the prophets 
speaking about Tyre's downfall. So we've got prophecies on the screen from Isaiah, Amos, Zechariah, Jeremiah, and then finally Ezekiel. And of course the, the prophecy of Ezekiel is the one in here that we're going to spend some time considering in Ezekiel chapter 26. So let's just begin then. So Ezekiel chapter 26, we get a, a bit of an introduction in verses 1 through to 3. And it came to pass in the 11th year in the first day of the month that the word of the Lord came unto me saying. So this isn't Ezekiel's word. This is the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh, the word of God. Son of man, because that Tyrus hath said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken, that was the gates of the people. She is returned unto me, I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. And so we see here the prophecy begins that, that Tyre, the people of Tyre, They'd, they'd gone far away from their previously close relationship with, with the Israelites. And they were now celebrating the fact that um, Jerusalem had been broken down, probably by Nebuchadnezzar. And so for this reason, God causes his prophet to utter forth this prophecy against Tyre. You see, in Amos 9, oh sorry, Amos 1 verse 9, we read that the people of Tyre had neglected the brotherly covenant that they'd had with the people of Israel under King Hiram. And so now they were to be punished for their, um, their waywardness in this regard. And so we get this very specific prophecy of the overthrow of Tyre. Now, I wonder if we could just, you could just humor me, because there's some very specific details that we need to pick up to correctly understand this prophecy. There's three sections the first is what we call the they section, which is between verses 3 and 6. And you see there, we, we read that many nations would come up against Tyre, and they, the many nations, shall destroy the walls of Tyrus. It says um, they, uh, the, that Tyre will become a spoil of many nations, and that they shall know that I am the Lord. So we have this very clear they section, all about the many nations that would come up like waves, against the city so we've got that they sections the waves of the nations and then right in the heart of the prophecy verses 7 through to 11 we have a, a very specific section about Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon and we read that this the, we read of him and and the, the 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 text clearly talks very specifically about he Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon in verse 7 he shall slay with a sword he shall make a fort he shall set engines of war. With his axes, he shall break down their towers. By reason of the abundance of his horses, when he shall enter into thy gates, with the hooves of his horses shall he tread down thy streets, he shall slay thy people. So it's very clear in the middle of this section that one of those nations that would come up like a wave against Tyre would be Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar the Great. And then finally the prophecy goes back again to, to speak more generally on a they section. You see that in verses 12 through to 14. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches, and they shall break down thy wolves, the many nations, and they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. So we've got these three sections. They, the, generals, the general nations, then a very specific section about Nebuchadnezzar, and then back to they again. Two clear parties, the general nations and Nebuchadnezzar. So let's just pick up some, clear, some, some details from these sections then as we go through. So the first they section, verses 3 to 6, here's the key headlines. God will cause many nations to come against Tyre like the waves of the sea. And these many nations, they were going to destroy the walls and towers of Tyre so that Tyre would eventually become like a bare rock. And eventually Tyre would be a place where fishermen would spread their nets on it and it would become a spoil or a plunder for the nations. And we read in verse 6 that her daughters or her sort of villages, her suburbs, her settlements would be slain so that, that all would know 
that God was the, the, the true God. Now when we dive into the Nebuchadnezzar section, verses 7 through to 11, we read that God is going to bring Nebuchadnezzar with many people against Tyre, that he would slay Tyre's daughters in the field and set up a siege tower and a mound against the city, and that battering rams would destroy the city walls, that many horses and chariots would be used to enter the city and to go through the city gates, so much so that the dust of these horses would cover the city. And in verse 11, we read that, that, that he was to slay the people of Tyre and pull down their strong uh, monuments or garrisons or, or pillars, as I, as I think um, was, was in the translation that we had as our introduction. And then finally, going back to the, the general um, aspect, the many nations, in verses 12 to 14, we read that these many nations collectively would make a spoil or plunder of the riches of Tyre, destroy the walls and houses, and interestingly, and most notably, they were to lay the stones and the timber of the city in the middle of the waters. And when it says lay, it means, the word really means to deliberately place. It's not like they're just going to chuck them in willy-nilly. They were going to place the actual materials of the city into the water. And in verse 13, we read of how God would cause the songs of Tyre to cease. And verse 14, again, most notably, we read that Tyre was to become a bare rock, a place to spread nets, and that Tyre would never be rebuilt. Very interesting and key points, perhaps, for us to consider. Now, as you go through, if you were to every, uh, you know, when you research Tyre, there's actually two ancient locations for the city of Tyre. Now, I've got on the, the screen there a map by Jean-Denis Barbie de Bocage, who was a French person, funnily enough, with a name like that. Um, and he was a great French geographer, and he made this map in 1802. And you might just be able to make out how he drew up the city. This is how he understood it in 1802. You see, here we have Tyre. On the left, we have Tyre, um, the, the, an island of Tyre. But also here, you might notice um, the city walls that he's drawn out there. And um, you might notice across there, he's put Pallia Tyre, which means old Tyre. And specifically, down in the bottom there, He's noted ruins of Palliatia. So there was this mainland Tyre, which was a quite a substantial city. Um, it's also known as Old Tyre, Insula Tyre. Um, there's quite a few Babylonian names, Suru, Ushai, and so on. And to the Greeks, it was known as Pallia Tyre, Old Tyre. But as you can see, there's also an island Tyre. So the question is, whenever we come against a prophecy of Tyre specifically, like this one here in Ezekiel chapter 26, we need to ask ourselves the question, well, which Tyre are, is being talked about? And I'd like to suggest to you that specifically, the prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 26 is co concerning the mainland Tyre. Why do we say that? Because it talks about Nebuchadnezzar coming against it with, with horses and chariots. Wouldn't be much use coming against an island with horses and chariots. In verse 8, we read of, of its fields. And in verse 10, we read of the dust of the horses going up against the, the city walls. All of those things would make no sense if we're talking about an island. We're talking here about the city of the, the mainland city of Tyre. And incidentally, in Bible times, you can make a note of Joshua 19, 29, where when the children of Israel are drawing out the, um, the boundaries of the different tribes, the tribe of Asher, it says, um, was uh, the, the borders of it went um, and encompassed the Sea of Tyre along the coast. And so the Sea of Tyre was inside the coastline, Joshua 19, verse 29. And that leads us to believe that, that definitely in Bible times, the mainland Tyre was the main Tyre thought about by the prophets. So now we need to think about the fulfillment of this. It's, a, it's an interesting prophecy, but how did it, has it been fulfilled and, and, and how, if so, has it been fulfilled? And I like, I'm a visual person, so I like to get a bit of an indication, a bit of a map as to where we are. So, so you're there, 2016, well hopefully you're here, and go, Ezekiel's 
prophecy, it can be pretty reliably dated by the, um, the dating in verse 1 to around 586 BC. And then we have these three fulfillments. And we're going to show, hopefully, how that Nebuchadnezzar fulfilled one part of the prophecy around 570 BC. The many nations then later fulfilled the other aspects of the prophecy in 332 and onwards. And then we have that kind of ongoing requirement, don't we, of Tyre being built no more. And so we've got these three aspects which we want to now spend some time considering. And now it will be a little bit of a history lesson, so please forgive me if you hate history, but I'll try and make it as quick and as painless as possible. But hopefully it will also be quite interesting because for me, when you actually go back and you understand the history surrounding some of these things, you realise how remarkable it is that this prophecy that was written eventually became fulfilled. And it really is truly amazing. So let's start with Nebuchadnezzar um, and just get a quick bit of background. We did have the Assyrian Empire that was, was around when Nebuchadnezzar was born in 634 BC. Nebuchadnezzar's dad started to rebel against the Assyrians and so, um, and he was called Nabu, Nabu Palasa. And as time went on, um, the Babylonians, they pushed the Assyrians back. So they took over Babylon, and uh, so the Assyrians fled to Nineveh and made their capital city at Nineveh. And then in 612 BC, the Babylonians pushed up there. So the Assyrians legged it to Haran, and they set up their capital city there. And under Nebuchadnezzar, they then pushed forward eventually um, again to Haran, and so they fled from Haran and went to a city called Carchemish. Carchemish and the battle of Carchemish was to be the decisive battle in the ancient world as to these powers that were, that were, were vying for supremacy. It's actually recorded in Jeremiah 46 and also 2 Chronicles 35, the battle of Carchemish. And what happens is that... Um, the, the king of the Assyrians, he calls for this guy, um, Pharaoh Necho, to come and give him a hand because he was really on his last legs. You may recall that um, Pharaoh Necho comes up and um, King Josiah decides against God's will to try and stop him. And of course, King Josiah dies um, in that attempt in, in 2 Chronicles 35 verse 20. Anyway, eventually Pharaoh Necho gets up there, but Nebuchadnezzar is too strong. And so he defeats both the, the power of the Assyrians and the other dominant power, the power of the Egyptians, which leaves the Neo-Babylonian Empire as the dominant power across the whole of the Middle East in this time period. And it's at this time when we read that actually, very early on, Tyre was kind of under the yoke, so to speak, of the Babylonians. In Nebuchadnezzar's first year, in... Um, 604 BC, we, we have this chronicle that he made. It's now in the British Museum. And in the chronicle, he, he boasts that all the kings of Hattiland, which um, is a catchphrase for all the kings of the West, that they all paid him tribute. So it seems that if Tyre hadn't been under that, he would have said, except for Tyre. But it seems that Tyre was under that. And incidentally, another one, King Nebuchadnezzar's Hof calendar. Uh, that was record that was written in the seventh year of King Nebuchadnezzar. It, we we have recorded that the king of Tyre sent some some goods to the king of um, Nebuchadnezzar and contributed towards a building project that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was working on. The king of Suru or Tyre. So early days when Nebuchadnezzar was was around uh, and just came to, to to power, Tyre was in subjection to him. But some time later, it did indeed rebel. Now, history is difficult from this time period. There's not a lot recorded. We'll have a look at what is recorded in a bit. But what seems to happen is that King Nebuchadnezzar indeed came to, um, to Tyre around 570 uh, BC and actually um, took it over and uh, subjected it to its authority. It didn't actually get destroyed though, it seems then, because Tyre is mentioned later on. It's even mentioned in Ezekiel. And God says that, that Nebuchadnezzar didn't get any wages for coming against Tyre. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't completely plunder Tyre. So it still existed. But let's just have a quick look before we go get back onto that point in a minute. This is um, where the key um, historical evidence for this comes from. It's actually from um, Josephus, who obviously lived some years later 
around um, 94 AD, so it's some time later, but Josephus had access to older documentation, now not in existence to, to us uh, today. And we see here he quotes from some of that. He says, moreover, we meet with a confirmation of what Barossus, that's again one of these Babylonian uh, scholars who we don't have much access to, Barossus says in the archives of the Phoenicians concerning this king, Nebuchadnezzar, that he conquered all Syria and Phoenicia, in which case Philostorus, and again, again that's another authority we don't have around today, um, agrees with the others in that history which he composed where he mentions the siege of Tyre. So Josephus is quoting from authorities of his day, and it's quite well established that Nebuchadnezzar did indeed take the city. And later in some more of um, Josephus's work, he quotes that uh, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Tyre for 13 years. And so we see that Nebuchadnezzar did, like the prophecy said, come against Tyre, besieged it for 13 years, and the evidence points to the fact that he did actually take it under his control. You know, it's amazing that um, in the excavations of, of Tyre that happened sort of in the early 19th century, they found tons of tablets. A lot of them got shipped off to Berlin um, and the Pergamon Museum. And it's only been recently when some of these tablets have been begun to be translated. And I find it absolutely fascinating. So there's this one here, for example, uh, from the Pergamon Museum. Um, which is written around 570 BC. It's a historical document, and it's talking about clay rash, uh, rations which the king of Babylon gave to his prisoners. And interestingly, in this particular historical clay tablet, it mentions that the king of Babylon was feeding 126 men from Tyre, which makes, which, which makes the experts suggest that this, this is an indication that Tyre had indeed been been, been taken under siege and captives, 126 of them, had been taken back to Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar was very kindly giving them some rations. Here's some more, and I'm, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's absolutely tons there, shed loads of them there, which you can uh, look up if, if, you, if you get time. To perhaps save some time, I actually emailed one of the researchers who are researching into these things, a, a lovely lady called Christian Kleber, and there she is there. She does a lot of uh, publications on academia.org in and around these issues. And this is what um, she said in one of her papers. The re-evaluation of a file of cuneiform texts mentioning Tyre and the identification of new texts now help to reconstruct the otherwise enigmatic political events around the famous 13-year siege of Tyre, thereby yielding new evidence on neo-Babylonian policy in the West. And so the archival material that, that was dug up in Tyre, some of it very close to the Ishtar Gate, um, shows a really heavy Babylonian presence in Tyre after the siege that must have taken place. And that, indeed, it became under control of the Babylonians, just as the Bible has stated here. So that's the Nebuchadnezzar section, the he section. What about the other nations? Remember, it says that, that the nations were going to come against Tyre like waves of the sea. So it wasn't just going to be Nebuchadnezzar. There's going to be others that are going to attack Tyre um, down through time. I think the most significant one was Alexander the Great's attack on Tyre. Alexander the Great, of course, was that great Greek warrior who came stampeding across the uh, east there from Greece. Um, you may see that he starts off in Greece, he comes down through the Holy Land into Egypt, then back up round, and he goes off uh, into the far uh, east over there. And as he comes down, he, history tells us that he, he came across Tyre and he got quite annoyed because it was a very difficult place to take. So he sets his mind against taking it, and there it is, Tyre there. But history also tells us that when he got to Tyre, he found that the ancient city of Tyre, the mainland Tyre, the Tyre that the prophecy is all about, had actually become abandoned. And so he easily takes the abandoned city. But what happens is the people have gone over and really set up shop over there in the island of Tyre. And this causes Alexander some, some uh, annoyance. And so apparently 40,000 people had, uh, had all kind of gone onto that island city and were, were sitting there as a uh, taunting Alexander in their little Phoenician colony. 
So what does he do? Well, he takes the ancient stones that used to make up the old city of Tyre and the, and the timber and the wood, and he actually builds a causeway across the sea to the, to the island. So annoyed is he that these people had, had fled and were ducking out of a fight, so to speak. And then not only that, is he gets a, an armada of, of, um, of, of boats from many different nations who ally themselves with him to come and help him attack the city. And then he makes his way across the causeway and he attacks by, by a boat and he actually takes the ancient city, uh, the, the island's part of, of Tyre. Now I think that's quite remarkable, don't you? Now history confirms this. Let's just read a couple of of bits and bobs from history. This is from Theodorus Cilicius, a Greek historian around 50 BC. He says, the king, that's Alexander, saw that the city could hardly be taken by sea because of the engines mounted along its walls and the fleet that it possessed. While from the land, it was almost unassailable because it lay four furlongs away from the coast. Nevertheless, he determined to run every risk and make every effort to save the Macedonian army from being held in contempt by a single undistinguished city. Immediately he demolished what was called Old Tyre and set many tens of thousands of men to work carrying stones to construct a mole too plethora in width. He drafted into service the entire population of the neighbouring cities and the project advanced rapidly because the workers were numerous. And so we see there, don't we, how amazing it is. You've got the drive of Alexander the Great, this ambition that he had. And that is causing this prophecy here in Ezekiel chapter 26 to be filled. Do you think, do you think um, Alexander the Great wanted to fulfill the words of Ezekiel? I very much doubt it. But here we have him specifically asking for the men around to rip up old Tyre and to place its, its, its materials very deliberately into the sea to build a mole, a causeway, a cross. Here's another one. It says, Alexander decided to build a mole from the mainland out to the city. The place he chose was a crossing covered in pools of water, which had shallows and patches of mud on the part close to the mainland, but close to the city. Where the deepest part of the crossing was, it was about 18 feet in depth. But there was a great quantity of stone and wood which they placed on top. And it was not a difficult matter to fix stakes in the mud and the mud itself bound together the stones so that they stayed in place. That was from the Anabastus of Alexander around the second century BC. And so again we get this amazing prophecy being fulfilled. I'm not going to read the next one, obviously you'll be pleased to know it's very long, but I'll, I'll read a couple of bits of it. Basically what this historian says is that um, there were all these other nations that joined with Alexander. 80 Phoenician ships nine trimmeries from Rhodes, ten from Lycia, a 50-oar ship from Macedonia. The kings of Cyprus arrived at Sidon, about 120 ships. So indeed, many nations did come against, um, against Tyre. Together with him were the kings of Cyprus and the Phoenicians, apart from Pontagoras, who was with Cratus. So we get this idea then that the, the, the many nations did indeed use old Tyre to, to get actually to, to island time. The last one, we read again the same sort of thing, and this is from another one, Quintus Curtius, who was a Roman his historian, and he said that a fleet arrived from Cyprus, so we get another uh, indication that it wasn't just one nation, there were many nations involved in this attack. And he says a great amount of rocks was available supplied by old Tyre. Now we could go on and on, there's loads and loads of historical references that we could quote, but hopefully we've done enough to show, particularly to, to people perhaps uh, if you've never looked into history, how indeed reliable the Bible is in terms of this is what the prophet had said, and this is confirmed now from the historical documents. But what about this almost ongoing requirement of the prophecy in verse 14? It says in verse 14 that Tyre would be a place to spread necks upon, and that it would be built no more. Now, the Romans around 60 BC built parts, rebuilt parts of the island city of Tyre. And that produced elements of which is now spread across Alexander's causeway. Um, 
But I'm going to suggest to you very, very heavily and very, very clearly that mainland Tyre, as it was, has never indeed been rebuilt as the Bible has prophesied. Where is the great trading centre of the ancient world today? The old city of Tyre lies under the silt and the sea. Its previous location is barren. So this is um, a shot of island Tyre in the, um, in the 1930s. And you can see that Alexander's causeway that had come across has uh, silt and sand has kind of built up over it. And interestingly, people... Um, even before this point, um, recorded, uh, if you go through any, most um, of the older Bible commentaries will record how travellers had gone round this area and seen that over this territory of the causeway, nets indeed were spread by fishermen to dry. And indeed on top of the ancient city, which lies underneath the silt and the sand in that area. This is what that area looks like today. And so the critics say, well, hold on a second. There's Tyre today. The Bible said Tyre would never be rebuilt. Therefore, the Bible must be wrong. Well, just hang on a second. Which Tyre are we talking about? A Tyre that was later called Tyre or the Tyre of the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 26? This is what the great geographer Strabo said. The Greek, he was, he was writing around 20 BC to 20 AD. He said, and he trekked these areas, Tyre is... Distant from Sidon, not more than 200 stadia. And between them lies a town called the city of Onothias. And then one comes to a river which empties near Tyre, and after Tyre, to Palaetire, at a distance of 30 stadia. Now what he's doing is, he's plotting and describing the territory and the geography uh, as you come from the north down to the south. And he says that there's this river which empties near Tyre, and then there's this distance of 30 stadia and then you come to old Tyre so 30 stadia south from Tyre you come to old Tyre Palais Tyre now that is approximately three three and a half miles and so if we get a map and we we plot three miles south we come down to that area there on the screen now that area has not been rebuilt. When we put the old city walls back over the top of the modern uh, map on the screen, you'll see it's not been rebuilt. There is no ancient trading city of Tyre. God had decreed, thou shalt be built no more, for I the Lord hath spoken it, saith the Lord God. And indeed, I think that's a, an amazing fulfilment of this prophecy. But you know what's even more amazing? When I look this up, Guess what's protecting that little area? Now, this is, this is from a website, Nature Reserves. And this is the Ramsar Sites Information Service. Ramsar is an international agreement, uh, particularly in wetlands. Um, and it's, it's absolutely amazing that I didn't put that mark on there. That's the area that they're protecting, this particular organisation. The ancient city of Old Tyre is protected under this Ramsar Convention. And we read that the Convention's mission is the conservation and wise use of all wetlands through local and national actions and international cooperation as a contribution towards achieving sustainable development throughout the world. There is no way, as long as this is upheld, that there, the ancient city of Tyre is going to be rebuilt in that area. Now, I find that absolutely remarkable. And there's, there's whole documents of, of um, things, apparently they have, they have beautiful turtles or something that, 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 uh, that go down there. It's a protected area. And so I hope we've, we've done our best to, to share with you then how amazing this prophecy actually is. That we have Nebuchadnezzar fulfilling parts of it, that we have the many nations fulfilling parts of it, and how dramatic it is that, that old Tyre was pulled apart and put in the sea. And then finally we've seen this ongoing requirement is indeed being fulfilled by the prophecy. We could ask the question, if we wanted to be hypercritical, well, was this written after the events described in Ezekiel 26? Like, has some imposter come in and rewritten, his, uh, rewritten this in accordance with history after these things have happened? And we'd like to suggest to you, absolutely, that cannot be the case. The, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls apparently has two copies of Ezekiel. Unfortunately, they haven't been able to uh, untangle them exactly because of their ancient age. But we definitely know 
that dating to around uh, the second to third century BC, that Ezekiel was part of the canon of scripture because it was part of the Septuagint translation. And that's definitely around the time of the attack of Alexander on Tyre. It was a fully accepted part of ancient Hebrew scripture at the time when the Septuagint was translated, uh, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture. And so it couldn't have just been popped in afterwards. It's impossible for that to be the case. And one other thing, of course, it is absolutely impossible that this ongoing requirement of it being built no more could have been written after the event, could it? And so we have before us a very strong case for the infallibility of scripture, for the divine hand at work, that God indeed is a God that can see the end from the beginning. And as we say, the pagan kings of Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander the Great, they had no interest, no motive in fulfilling these words of Ezekiel. Nor do the people who set up the Ramah Convention uh, and the conservation area. Nor do all of those historians that have recorded and put their name to, to the records of old that have confirmed the fulfilment of this prophecy. And so for me, I think this is quite an amazing prophecy that we've had before us and again it does indeed confirm that the God of the Bible is unique there is no God like him declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done and so the logic is is that if we can trust this small part of the Bible then surely we can trust the other parts of the Bible that we have before us and within the Bible it claims that there is a message of salvation, the gospel message, the good news. We read in Timothy, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished unto all good works. You see, the scriptures that we have in our hands, they are given by God. They are not from man. And we read here that they have a message of salvation in them. And so as the Christadelphians and, and as me standing before you representing the Christadelphians, we would encourage you to read its pages and to really try and get to understand the hope of the gospel of salvation that we find within it. And we'd thoroughly encourage you to come back and hear other Bible talks and also to study these things more fully.